Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem longest palindromic subsequence. We're given a string s and we want to return the length of the longest palindromic subsequence. To quickly review, a subsequence of a string like b, b, a, b is basically a sequence of characters in this string where we are allowed to skip some characters. Like we could skip this A if we wanted to. The resulting string then is just B, B, B. Is this a palindrome? Yes, because a palindrome basically means the string, when it's been reversed, take this and reverse it, it's still gonna be B, B, B well, a fourth B, and these two happen to be equal. So this is a palindromic subsequence of the original string, and it happens to be the longest one. The length of it is four. So there's actually two solutions to this problem, but before I get into it, I want to say that I highly recommend solving the longest common subsequence problem before attempting this one. This one becomes pretty easy after you understand this one, and this is one of the most popular interview questions. I have a video on it that I'll link below if you want to check it out. But it's funny that this algorithm actually can exactly solve this problem. It's a pretty clever solution. So I'll explain to you how it works. The LCS algorithm takes two strings, such as A, A, B, and maybe X, A, Y, A. And with these two strings, we find the length of the longest common subsequence. You can kind of tell what it is just by looking at it. If we take the first two A's from this string and we take the two A's from this string, they are the same string, two A's, right? So the length of it is gonna be two. We can actually be really clever with this problem and apply this algorithm to this problem, even though there's just a single input string. Basically, we would take the input string, that would be one parameter, and we would also take the reverse of this string, which would be B, A, B, 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 and then run LCS on these two strings. Not only would it find the length of the longest common subsequence, but it guarantees that the subsequence also happens to be a palindrome because we reversed the input string, so it must be a palindrome. Let me explain exactly why first. So we know with this string, this happens to be the result, four Bs. In this example, it's pretty obvious that LCS is gonna find that string. Four consecutive Bs is the longest common subsequence between these two strings. But is it guaranteed that the longest common subsequence is always going to be a palindrome? Why is that the case? Well, what if we had a string like this, A, A, B, and then some other characters, X, Y, Z, whatever, and then we took the reverse of this string, B, A, A. Is it ever possible that the LCS algorithm is gonna find a subsequence that is not a palindrome? Is it possible that if we pass this string and the reverse of this string into our LCS function, it's gonna identify this as the longest common subsequence, which is of length three, which in this case, clearly this is not a palindrome. Is that ever gonna happen? My answer to you is no. It's obvious when you look closely. If we ever find a string over here, and we also find the reverse of the string somewhere else in the input string, can't we take the concatenation of these two strings, which is A, A, B, and then here, B, A, A, and look at this, it's a palindrome. So if we ever find a string over here that matches a string over here, and this string happens to not be a palindrome, doesn't matter. We can combine them and make a palindrome anyway. So I pretty much proved to you that if we pass a string and the reverse of it into LCS, we're always gonna get a palindrome as the result. And if we're always gonna get a palindrome as the result, clearly the LCS algorithm is gonna find the longest palindrome by definition definition, that's what LCS stands for, longest common subsequence. So literally, if you can code this algorithm up, you can solve this problem. The time complexity of LCS, if you code it up efficiently, is going to be n times m, where these are the lengths of the two input strings. But clearly, in this case, both input strings are going to be of the same length. So we can say the time complexity is big O of n squared, where n is the size of this string. So I'm going to quickly show you the code, even though it's pretty much just going to be this algorithm. But then I'm going to show you the more intuitive way to solve this problem, because to be honest, I was not able to come up with this clever approach when I first solved this problem. I came up with a different approach, but it's similar to LCS. 
So very quickly, this is the longest common subsequence algorithm. I pretty much just copy and pasted it because you can literally take your solution from a different leak code problem. And then all you have to do is call it like this. We're calling the longest common subsequence, passing in the input string S. And for the second parameter, we're passing in the reverse of the string S. This is how you do it in Python. You can do it differently in other languages, but this is literally how you can solve the problem. I'll run it quickly to prove it to you. And as you can see, it does work. Now, if you want a deeper understanding of this algorithm, I have a full video on it. So you can check that out below. Now quickly, let me show you a different way to solve this problem. It's also going to be a dynamic programming approach. And we're gonna borrow a lot from LCS. We're gonna look at this input example, but I'll also mention that we're also gonna borrow ideas from leak code problem five. I think it's longest palindromic substring. And the idea is that to find the longest palindrome from a string efficiently, instead of starting from left to right and looking at this string and then looking at this string and this string, that's gonna be very brute force and we're gonna end up getting n squared substrings. And then for each string, we have to check if it's a palindrome or not, that's gonna be n cubed. There is a more efficient way to do it. We start at each character from here. We start expanding outwardly because it's more efficient to do it that way because for each position, we can only expand up to n characters and we have only n positions here anyway, so we eliminate some of the repeated work because what we can do from a character like B here in the middle, we can look at its two neighbors. First of all, we know that this string B itself is a palindrome. Any single character is a palindrome, but now when we look at the neighbors, this B and this A, these do not match each other. If we want this string to be a palindrome, these neighbors must match each other. Clearly they don't, in this case, so we can't make a longer palindrome centered around this position. So we can pretty much give up. Then we might wanna try over here. We try expanding left and right. These two neighbors are the same. So this is a palindrome. Now we might try to expand again, but there are no more characters left over here. There are some over here. Clearly we can't expand this palindrome that's centered around this position. If we start at each individual character and try to expand outward, we're only gonna get palindromes of odd length. If we also wanna get the palindromes of even length, we start at each pair of characters. Like now we check the palindrome centered around these two characters and we try to expand outwardly. But before we even do that, we have to make sure that these two characters are equal. And in this case they are, but we can't expand any further. Next, we might wanna try this position. And then we'd look at the two neighbors, B and A. These do not match each other, so we can't get a longer palindromic substring centered around this position. But so far, I've only been talking about substrings. This problem is not about substrings. It's a bit more complicated. We are talking about subsequences here. So how do we get longest common subsequences? Because ultimately, we know our result is gonna be this, the four Bs. And yes, it's gonna be centered around this position. So how would we get the solution? Well, we would look at our neighbors, B and A. They're not the same. So what do we do? Do we just give up looking from this position? No, because with subsequences, we are allowed to skip characters. So what we might say now is let's consider skipping this character or let's consider skipping this character. We don't know which one is gonna lead us to the result. So we have to try both ways. We have to sort of brute force this algorithm. So to brute force this algorithm, first I'm going to give an index to each of these values. And let's say we're starting here with our decision tree. We have a pointer. Let's say I is gonna be at index one, J is gonna be at index two. So that's how I'm gonna represent our decision tree. We're at this sub string. So this is kind of the range that we are considering so far. It doesn't necessarily mean we are including every single character in the range as I'm gonna show you in just a second. But now we are gonna try to expand outward. And the reason we're expanding outward is because we found that these two characters do match each other. And I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do when these characters don't match each other. But for now, we can go ahead and expand the I this way and the J in the other direction. We don't even have multiple decisions here. We just have a single decision because we're being greedy. We can include both of these, so that's what we're gonna do. So now our I pointer is gonna be zero. Our J pointer is gonna be three. Here though, we find that the characters B and A do not 
match each other. So we don't give up searching in this direction though. We're going to try to skip both characters. In the case that we end up skipping the B character, what we would say is take our I pointer and decrement it one more time. Clearly, when we try to do that, we're going to end up here, negative one, three. That means our I pointer went out of bounds, so we can't do anything anymore. At this point, we do have to give up, but there was another opportunity for us where our J pointer, which is at index three here, is going to be shifted to the right one more time. It's going to be four. We're going to have zero, four. And at this point, we see that this character at index four and the character at index zero, I know I have it crossed out over here, but they're both Bs, so they do match each other. By the time we get here, we find that the longest palindromic subsequence so far is going to be of length four. I think it's clear that this approach, this brute force approach, will lead us to the correct solution. But what's the time complexity and how can we make this more efficient? I think that's best explained by taking taking a look at the code. So that's what I'm going to do right now. But we can see that clearly this decision tree is going to be exponential in the worst case. The length of the string is n. Roughly the height will be the same thing. And we are in the worst case branching twice at each node. So in the worst case, the size of this tree is going to be two to the power of n. But I'm going to show you how we can use memoization, a dynamic programming technique to make this more efficient and actually be n squared. Let's do that now. As I mentioned, we are going to do this recursively. So I'm going to create a method called DFS. And we're going to have two parameters, the index i and the index j, or you could say left and right, lr. I think that might be more descriptive, but I'll stick with this because that's what I used in the drawing explanation. First, let's start with the base case, which was kind of obvious from the drawing explanation, but it's going to be when one of these pointers goes out of bounds. If i is too small because i is our left pointer, if it's less than zero, or if j is too big, meaning it's equal to the length of S. In that case, we would say the longest palindromic subsequence is zero of the subsequent characters. Next, we have a couple cases. One, what if the characters in these two positions match each other? If the character at pointer I is equal to the character at pointer J, that means the characters match. In the other case, that means the characters don't match. I think this case is a bit more interesting, so I'm gonna start with that. But this is the one where we have to branch in both directions. We have to make a DFS call where we decrement our I pointer. We shift it to the left while keeping the J pointer the same. But we also have a case where we do the opposite. We keep I the same, but we increment our J pointer. We shift it towards the right. We don't know which one of these is gonna result in a maximum palindromic subsequence. So we try both of them and we take the max of their result. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, before I fill in this case, I'm going to show you how we're actually going to be using this DFS. This is going to return the length of the longest palindromic subsequence. And I'm going to show you quickly how we're going to use it. We're going to go through every position in our input string S. So we need the length of S. And for each of these positions, we're going to call our DFS where I is both going to be the left character and the right character. This is where we're calculating the odd length palindromic subsequences. But we know we also have to calculate even length palindromic subsequences, which we can do like this, where we have I, but the second character is going to be I plus one. This is the even length palindromic subsequences. It still guarantees, though, that we call our DFS method, I think two times n times. So still not too bad. It won't change the overall time complexity that we are calling this twice. So now that we know that, it kind of informs us how to handle this if statement because it's possible that i and j could be at the same character or they could be at different characters. This is going to inform how we calculate the length of this palindromic subsequence because if i is equal to j, then we want length to be assigned to one. We have one character that is a palindrome. But if they are not at the same character, then we want this to be assigned to two. We want the length to be two. 
because we found two different characters that are the same. So we filled in most of the skeleton of this DFS. Well, here, I guess one thing that's missing is we now want to continue to do DFS, but in this case, we're going to shift both of the pointers. We're gonna decrement I and we're gonna increment J because we found two characters that match so we can shift both pointers. And we're gonna add the result of this DFS to the length that we just computed. It could be one or it could be two. And this is what our result would be, adding these two together. Even though I'm not returning anything yet and I'm not really calculating the entire result, this is pretty much the brute force solution. We're gonna be doing a lot of repeated work. The total number of possible combinations of i and j that could be passed into this DFS is n squared because this could have n possible values, this could have n possible values, so it's n squared. Clearly within the loop, we're only doing O of one operations other than the recursive calls. So if we can cache the repeated work in a cache, which I'm going to use a hash map, but you could also use a two-dimensional array. If we can cache the repeated work, we can get the time complexity to be n squared. So that's what I'm going to do. First things first, our second base case is going to be if this has already been computed, if i and j happens to already be in our cache, then we're going to return the value that is stored in the cache. So let's do that. And also anytime we compute a result, we want it to be stored inside the cache. That's kind of the whole point. So I'm going to copy this. And here where we are computing the result, if the characters match, we want to assign that to this position in the cache. In the else case, we want to do the same thing. Let's assign this to the cache. And our ultimate return value is going to be what we ended up storing in the cache. And the way that I'm calculating this, we could use the return values from these method calls to maintain like a max value, but it's a little bit easier to just say return the cache dot values. So this will be the entire list of values stored in our cache and we want to return the maximum one. So we can do it just like this. I'll run the code to make sure that it works. Okay, well, the code does work, but it is giving time limit exceeded. Even though this is the same big O time complexity as the first solution that I showed you. So that's unfortunate. I'm pretty sure that this would get accepted in a language like C++ if you coded it like the exact same way. You can let me know in the comments, but this is unfortunate. It's possible that if we coded this up without recursion, it would pass on leak code. And I'll quickly copy and paste the code for that. But I think this video has dragged on long enough. I think the most important thing is understanding the solution and how to arrive at it, not getting it passed on leak code. So I'll run this really quickly to see if this will work. Okay, I guess it does. That's unfortunate, but I try not to waste too much time on what leak code deems as like an acceptable solution or not even though both of these are the same big O time complexity. So I'll leave it at that. You can let me know if you have any comments below. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.